Exodus 7, across the Red Sea and in the Midian. Follow me. All right, Exodus 14, 6 is where we'll go. And Pharaoh makes ready his chariot, and he took his people with him. If I had a trumpet, I could do the, you know, the whole charge thing. Moses has been out of Goshen for four days. He's moving as fast as he can. Pharaoh's spies, they go back, right? They get, it takes another four days to go back. It would have taken Pharaoh some time to structure his militia and prepare them for the chase. So we add two more days to prepare his army. That puts Moses about 10 days outside of Egypt proper before Pharaoh, all his army, the 600 chosen chariots begin the drive to their doom. Pharaoh is going to move faster in pursuit than Moses can travel because of the immense number and nature of the people Moses is leading. God had given Moses some extra help with the pillar of fire so they could travel at night. Moses may have been slow, but Moses was steady. Considering Moses was about 10 days outside of Pharaoh's reach before Pharaoh began his chase, how long would it take for Pharaoh to catch up with him? If Moses travels at two thirds of the speed of the Egyptian army, it should take Pharaoh and his charioteers approximately six days from Goshen to catch up to the point where Moses was and when Pharaoh began his pursuit. That gives Moses another six days of traveling, putting him out 16 days. It would take Pharaoh approximately four more days to reach where Moses was at that point. So Moses now has a three day lead on Pharaoh. And finally, then they should meet somewhere in the next 48 hours. This means that Moses would be approximately 22 days out of Goshen before Pharaoh and his troops would catch them. If Pharaoh's armies moved at twice the speed of Moses, that's still approximately 12 to 15 days for Moses to be outside of Egypt proper before their faithful meeting, which would give them plenty of time. You know, 12 to 15 days still gives them plenty of time to get to the real Red Sea crossing site. Verse 7. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains or officers over every one of them. Pharaoh's 600 chosen chariots was the king's guard consisting of three riders, one charioteer and two warriors. The regular Egyptian chariots usually only had two riders, but one to fight while the other drove the chariot. But on this occasion, they also took a third war, uh, warrior. Josephus adds that in addition to there being 600 of the finest chariots of Egypt, there were approximately 18,000 cavalry and about 80,000 soldiers plus priests. So the two-thirds pace is probably more accurate. Every soldier and priest would want to go, uh, wanting to avenge the loss of the firstborn. Plus, you know, you would need a large army to fight against 600,000 able men of Moses. Even if they didn't have weapons, that's still 600,000 people. Verse 8, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. They went out defiantly. You know, I'm going goodbye. We're staying gone. But the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. And he overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihahara, beside Baal Zephon. Baal Zephon is in Saudi Arabia. It's on the other side. You got, you're going to have uh, one fort, Migdal, here, and then if you, on the other side, Saudi Arabia, is where you're going to have Baal Zephon. Now, a Phoenician-style column was located at the southern end of Nueva Beach before Payahara. Its inscriptions were defaced or eroded. Later, an identical column was discovered at Baal Zephon on the opposite shore in Saudi Arabia. So this is what we're talking about. Um, during the 1973 uh, Egypt-Israeli war, the, when Israel came in and um, uh, they took the Sinai, basically, they found that lying there on, on, on the beach. So they set it up and put it in concrete. And there's Paul Anderson at the, you know, there. Uh, and there's a bunch of little kids that come over and try and, you know, beg for money. So they were harassing Paul. You know, so, so that gives you an idea how tall it is. All right? So, um, the, but when Ron Wyatt saw the other one on the other side in Saudi Arabia, it uh, the, uh, the inscriptions were intact, and he could read it. And it read, they were erected, so a pillar on each side. They were erected by King Solomon 
in honor of Jehovah and dedicated to the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea by Moses and the destruction of the Egyptian host at this spot. There is just so much evidence that this is the spot of the Red Sea crossing. This just adds to it. Now, uh, later on, when Ron came back and other people looked for it, that pillar was gone. Uh, the Saudi Arabians are collecting artifacts. They're supposed to open this giant museum. It may or may not be in there, but it disappeared. All right, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, he marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? The reaction is not too encouraging, is it? This attitude doesn't illustrate a real trust in God, even after witnessing what he had just done with the plagues to allow you to leave Egypt. Oh, that's what you did. You and Pharaoh cut a deal. That's why we're out here, huh? Oh, thanks. Verse 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians, that we should die in the wilderness. They had asked God for help, but they wanted to reject the helper God had sent. Verse 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, do not be afraid. Remember, that's the first thing you got to deal with people many times. Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the deliverance of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall just shut up. I mean, and you shall hold your peace. You shall be still. The Lord will take care of it. Now, the Wadi White tour, that when they came through it, with its walls rising up about 2,000 feet of sheer rock, it leads through the mountains, opening on the middle of a wide sandy beach on the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the right finger of the Red Sea. And that beach is known as Nuweiba Beach. Okay, The real name of it is Nuweiba al Muzayana, which means waters of Moses' opening. It's large enough for Israel to encamp by the sea where the desert had shut them in. And that beach is about four and a quarter miles long by two miles wide. And then we stayed at the Hilton there. We were at the Nuweiba Hilton. That's where we had uh, that's where we had Mexican night. The Egyptians put our Mexican night there at the Hilton that night. So we came, you know, thousands of miles for Mexican night at Nuweiba Beach. Now, a swatch of seafloor from Nuweiba Beach to the Saudi Arabian shore. So if you're standing in the Weaver Beach and you're staring across at Baal Zafong, all right, there they there's a um uh, a swatch of seafloor. And it's only about 760 to 800 feet deep. The massive flat sandbar runs eight miles across, over a half mile wide, slopes gently at six degrees on both sides. Easily around 50 people abreast could cross at the same time. This consistent pathway spread across the Gulf via the sandbar to the other shore, that when the water was removed, you could have easily traveled across on dry land. So you get there. Now look, if you had, if you just had to drop eight feet or six feet, the road ends and then it continues six or eight feet down, you couldn't do that, that wouldn't work. This is a sand that just come in six degrees, nice, all the way across six degrees coming out the other side. Nice ramps, works perfectly. Nature had formed this land bridge uh, at the narrow section of the Gulf by accumulating sediments washed from the mountains on either side when the wadi was flooding. Artifacts like chariot parts, horse and human bones had been discovered and identified on the sandbar floor. See, once Pharaoh's army had entered the wadi, Israel was shut in by the mountains. But Pharaoh's army trapped Israel there, but in spiritual reality, God had trapped Pharaoh's army. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, 
I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his host, his army, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Okay, this top picture, there's Naweba Beach. Okay, there it is. There's there's another picture of it from uh, from behind it. And that, this gives you an aerial picture to show you how big it is. It just happened to be there. Come out to Wadi, big beach, sandbar all the way across. It's almost like God knew that it was there. Uh, this angel of God, I always wondered if this was Michael. Since Michael fights for God's people, if he was the angel that, you know, uh, was with them and then he went to the front and just kind of like held up his hand and you guys aren't coming <laughs> you egyptians are there you know and then the pillar of course the cloud was there and nobody was going anywhere and that pillar stayed in the rear between the two camps <laughs> keeping pharaoh's army from attacking verse 20. and it came between the camp of the egyptians and the camp of israel and it was a cloud in darkness a very dark cloud and thick darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land into firm ground, and the waters were divided. Yeah, see, this, you know, we, we always read the dry land. You could translate it firm ground. They came across on a firm ground, on a dry land, a firm ground. Moses and God are working together. Uh, the Egyptians could not move until the thick darkness moved. Remember that cloud came over and just sat there. Pharaoh couldn't move until you know that lifted. So they were stuck there, and we got a strong east wind. All right, if you're if you're like 900 feet down or uh, 700 feet down. What is uh, now 800 feet, 700, 700, feet down at the deepest point? The wind's got to come through there. It's going to take a little bit of time for it to blow it up and then for it to freeze along the side. So, uh, my point being is that it was too strong a wind for them to go into it. The headwind had to be awful strong to be able to do that. So, you're not going to, you know, uh, you're not going to go into that until the wind stops. And everything's in place. So when you work this, as long as that cloud was there, even if it was a couple days, all right, they were still Egypt still wasn't going anywhere. So it, it, it most of the time you think it's one night. The more I looked at this, the more I think it could be two, maybe even three nights for the wind to keep blowing across on the east, getting everything set, and then for them to come across. But as long as that cloud's there, it doesn't matter. Okay. Verse 22. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, daybreak, 2 a.m. to sunrise, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled or threw into panic the host or the army of the Egyptians and took off clogging their chariot wheels that they braved them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Yeah, I don't think there's enough time. Uh, for Israel to be all the way, for the wind to blow and Israel to come across, because it's going to take five to seven hours for two and a half million people to cross over that. Uh, and then these guys in the morning watch. So that time frame to have uh, to have them starting across, uh, I just don't think it would work. But you know what? The Lord threw them into a panic. They started coming across, and all of a sudden, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> there are serious problems with their chariots. There is speculation that not only did the waters freeze into the walls, but the sand froze too. 
since they went over on a firm ground. It would not be slippery, but rather like concrete. Wet sand would be hard on the wheels of loaded carts. Pharaoh started his pursuit across the causeway before the morning watch. By this time, his armies had ventured too far in the frozen sand that the hot sun would start to melt the walls and sand so that the Egyptian chariot wheels would break through the sand floor into ruts, snap off, stopping them in pursuit of the children of Israel. Now, pictures and recordings taken at this site show the remains of the Egyptians. Coral encrusted chariot wheels and 80 feet of water have been found, some still connected to their axles. Skeletal remains. Um, skeletal remains um, all over the place down there. People, horses scattered all over the place. Um, and if you uh, look at some of the stuff Ron's got, or, or the other book that's talking about with Leonard Moeller, um, you could uh, you can see quite a bit of them. But one of the things that helps to document this is four, six, and eight spoke chariot wheels were found, which were identified by the Department of Antiquities in Cairo as belonging to the 18th dynasty. Apparently, only during the 18th dynasty were eight spoked wheels used. The eight spoked wheel was an experiment by the Egyptian wheelwrights, and when it proved unsuccessful, they settled on the sixth as the standard. Monuments have been dated by the number of spokes in a chariot wheel, kind of like dating a movie by looking at the make and model of the cars or the type of cell phones being used. Okay, so if you have one, uh, here's a chariot. This is from King Tut. It's a it's your modern day six spoke. Uh, six spoke wheel uh plenty of room for three people to be there what's the bidding i hear for this so this is an actual one they got out of pharaoh's tomb okay now let me show you here uh this this is a four spoke gold a four spoke gold that's it's gold veneer so that's why there's no coral on it and then down over on this side is an eight spoke so you got an eight spoke with core uh hub wheel with it and then you can see uh the coral the way it goes out so you got an eight here and you got a four there and you got plenty of sixes helping to date 18th dynasty which would fit perfectly when you look at the chronology properly of when 1446 when moses started uh when they started heading the exodus took place okay so a gold veneer four spoke chariot wheel was found on the Egyptian side of the Gulf of Aqaba. What's interesting is Ron White saw that find it since, but we got a picture of it, uh, it indicating that whoever, it, it was it was on the Egyptian side. You know, as they were coming across, uh, this was found closer to the Egyptian side, indicating that whoever was driving that particular model was at the rear of the army. No cartouches or feral markings were seen on it, so it's believed to have belonged to one of the priests, which would explain why it was at the back of the parade. The priests certainly would have gone along since they were so ridiculed recently by the plagues and had mocked the gods they were serving. They were seeking revenge along with Pharaoh. So you've got the, the four-spoke wheel towards the end. Uh, Judith Sudolowski, who's the deputy director of the Marine branch of the IAEA. The IAEA is the Israel Antiquities Authority. And she states in Biblical Archaeology Review magazine, water is one of the best conservers of ancient objects because it provides a stable environment in terms of heat, light, and humidity. Metals reach a certain level of damage due to exposure to the water, and then they stop. And boy, that fit with, you know, with this four-spoke uh, wheel. So as you pass through the Wadi White Tour, you notice that rocks and boulders, when you come through it, you see rocks and boulders have been pushed to the side so that there was a clearing there to make a road through there. But this clear pathway continues under the Red, Red Sea. Rocks and boulders line the edges of the underwater sandbar as if someone pushed them to the side to get rid of any obstacles that might hinder anyone who happened by. All the way from the Weepa Beach to Bales of Phone, a pathway was cleared so people with carts and animals could travel quickly Cross an uncovered land bridge. First guy's in. Got sent a whole bunch of, you know, sent, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. They went in to clear the pathway, move the rocks to the side so everybody could keep moving. 
and you can still see the, the rocks piled up on each side of the sandbar. Oh, just a naturally occurring phenomenon. Okay, verse 26, Bob. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. God continues to magnify Moses in their sight. Moses' level of believing, of believing God certainly wasn't inspired by his earthly fellowship that he was keeping, because the people were always complaining about him and accusing him of something. Despite the unbelief and the treatment they showed him, Moses stood strong, displaying complete trust in God. Verse 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength, the normal depth, when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Well, if none of them, none of them escaped, that implies that Pharaoh himself did not escape. I know Yul Brynner did in, in the Charles Esther movie, but according to the Bible, he didn't. Verse 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of or through the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand, and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work or power which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So what do you do when the enemy's all gone? 15 1. Then sang Moses. And the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And Miriam, Hebrew form of Mary, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel like a tambourine in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Dance party! This song was composed on the scene when the waters of the Red Sea covered the Egyptian army, chariots, and horsemen. In the East, songs of victory and mourning are composed instantly. The composer would sing the first part, and the people would repeat what he had just sung. This song was composed by Moses and was sung by the people as they danced and glorified God. The song gives a vivid description of the triumph of the Israelites who trusted in the God of their fathers and of the sudden defeat of the Egyptian army. And you know what? This song is the first song in the Bible. And we will, we will explore it in more depth in two weeks at the next segment. So, time to leave. We partied it up. We gathered weapons, and Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Moses was familiar with the land across the sea because it's Midian. He's only lived there for 40 years. He knew the way to a place of safety where he had friends and was well-respected. Although his in-laws probably didn't expect him to come with two and a half million of his relatives the way he did. Hey, Jethro, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> All of us. Mm -hmm. you know? All right, verse. Uh, let's go back and look at uh, God, what God told uh, Moses early on. Exodus 6, 2 through 8. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abram, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by nine, my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in unto the land concerning which I did swear to give it 
to Abram, Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it for you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Notice the eyes in this passage. Once God has declared what he is going to do, it's up to him to fulfill the promises he made. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken? Shall he not make it good? Shall he not fulfill it? God spoke all this promise. He's going to have to, you know, fulfill it. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. And there is nothing too hard for thee. And in verse 27 of that chapter, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And these are great verses to remind ourselves when we find ourselves in tough times. I don't know, I've got quite sure how this is going to happen, but God goes, uh, is there anything too hard for me? And then Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord. I change not. I'm still around helping. So now God has to back up his word. He has to fulfill his promise to get them to the land that he had promised them. He need, but we, we need to bear in mind that there are certain parameters that God has to observe, though. For example, God cannot overstep free will. It's a lot easier if you did, you know. Uh, but he can encourage, he can exhort, but they have to do it. They have to act on his words. They have to trust him. They have to believe that what Moses was saying was from God. And then they have to respond accordingly. Reminds us of 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Just like today, we are the ones who have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We carry out the ministry of bringing men and women back to God. We have been given the message of hope for our world in this confusing, evil time. And if people don't carry it out, it won't get done. Another point is that God has to be just. The justice of God must be considered along with the variables of grace and mercy. God has to be concerned about the human factor, the fact that he is dealing with flesh and blood. Very few will get the spirit upon them. So how does God communicate with them? We do know and understand that through the Passover meal, everyone had been completely healthy to start with. God had already handled that need. And we read about that in Psalm 105, 37. As far as directions, well, just follow where God leads. Cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. This was a constant reminder of God's goodness being with them at all times. Just look at the pillar or the column. At any time, day or night, it's always there. It doesn't disappear, right? As God Almighty, as El Shaddai, he must supply every need that will come up. He must protect them against wild animals. He must protect them against extreme weather, other nations. You know, will other nations attack? How about passageway through their land? Will they let an army of people of that size with that many animals graze on their land? Would you? That's how you feed your family. They got two and a half million people coming, you know, coming through your neighborhood with a whole bunch of animals eating anything they can find. Then God also has to deal with, shall we say, a few other minor details, like the need for food to eat, water to drink, clothing that will not wear out. There are no stores of any kind anywhere. How do you sustain health for over two million people? Teach them yoga? Is there some relief from the weather available? How about transportation problems? Can wagon wheels hold up under this topography? How about animal care? Tents that can withstand windstorms, settling disputes that arise, what to do with your dad? And perhaps the biggest problem of all, these people seem to have extremely short memories, constantly complaining, even after seeing the mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, so with the immediate problem solved, the Egyptians being deceased, Different dangers lurk. The fierce Amalekites lived in this area. There would also be an immediate need for food and water, and enough food and water for approximately two and a half million people. There was no fast food restaurants around. There's no Walmart. There's not even a Starbucks. 
God didn't close all the restaurants and watering halls in the area. There was none to begin with. They were in the desert. Once the Egyptian army had been waterlogged, the Bible describes the great rejoicing that followed this miraculous deliverance. The men armed themselves with Egyptian weaponry, salvaging whatever washed up on the seashore. And this weaponry would come in handy because the Amalekites would soon attack. Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured or complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? In Exodus 20, 15, 24, like Knox going, his translation is, they were loud in their complaints. Well, how long did it take before they started to complain? Three days. Three days. That's all. Reality started to set in rather quickly that they were in a wilderness desert. Exodus 15, 25 says, and he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. The New uh, American Bible says, he pointed out to them a certain piece of wood. And the rest of 25 says, which when he cast it in the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute, decree, law, a prescribed task, and a judgment, an ordinance. And there he tested them. Taylor uh, translates this as to test their commitment to him. After the water was purified, Moses reminded them that God would completely meet every need. He would absolutely take care of them if they followed his word. Verse 26. And said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee, your healer. He is the healer. Um, Jehovah Rafika. Uh, Rafika sometimes is shortened under the word Rafa. So Jehovah Rapha means Jehovah will heal. This is the second of the seven redemptive names of God. There are 10 combined usages of the word Jehovah, of which seven are redemptive names. God in relationship to that which he has created that are used in the Bible. The first was Jehovah Jirai, and it was used in Genesis 22, 14. Jehovah will see and provide. It's used when the Lord substituted a ram for Isaac when Abraham was attempting to sacrifice him. God, in relationship to his creation, is not only going to watch over his creation, but will also provide for his creation. The third redemptive name of God, in relationship to that which he has created, comes up very shortly in Exodus 17, 15, Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. And I gave you a handout that goes into uh, all 10 of them, and the first seven of them are redemptive names. The other three deal with them, but they're not redemptive. So, verse 27, God. And they came to Elam, where they were found twelve wells or springs of water, and threescore and ten psalm trees, palm trees, and they encamped by there by the waters. There are no palm trees throughout the large wadis which lead from the seashore directly east to Mount Sinai, which tells us that they did not take the direct route to Mount Sinai, but they did travel in a wadi canyon first east, then south. So when they came across uh, into Saudi Arabia or Arabia, as it's called there. There's wadis. They would travel in them so they wouldn't be seen. There's one that went straight to Mount Sinai, but there's no palm trees anywhere, so they couldn't have gone that way. So they headed east for a while, then they headed south. But they traveled in them for protection. There are two north-south wadis in this range that are large enough to be traveled in. They both end to the south, where they meet with an east-west wadi, where these three wadis intersect. There's an extremely large oasis with hundreds of palm trees and 12 wells of water. This must have been the location of Elam. The 70 palm trees have proliferated. Now there's hundreds of their descendants thriving in this extremely desolate and arid region. The oasis, though, is so large that it extends all the way across the width of the wadi. The wells are randomly located, and today they still provide water, those 12 wells. In fact, recently they walled them up with concrete, so they'll last longer. All right, Exodus 16, 1. Where do we go next? 
And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, Bush, which is between Elam and Sinai, the Bush of Jehovah, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. They left on the 15th day of the first month. This is now the 15th day of the second month. Now we're in Nayar. Uh, we're 29 or 30 days later. Moses had to be on top of Mount Sinai, though, by, on the 50th day after Passover for the inaugural Pentecost to receive the law. So you can't start something unless, you know, you're there on time. So he's already 30 days into it. He's got 20 days to get to the true Mount Sinai and get on top of it so he, he can receive the law from God. The first Pentecost. That is... Uh, all right, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel were so glad. Oh, wait a minute. They murmured. They grumbled. They spoke bitterly against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And again, already? And the children of Israel said unto them, Would the God we had died by the hand of the Lord uh, in the hand of, in Egypt? We sat by the flesh pots, but we did eat bread to the full. And you brought us forth into the wilderness to kill us all assembly with hunger. Well, let me ask you a question. What decision would you make? Being a slave with food and bondage or freedom with God's promises in the desert? Verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate, a day's portion, every day, that I may prove them, whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass on the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At even, then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Yeah, Moses is reminding the people that it's God who they're really you know, grumbling about, not him or Aaron. Hey, dude, it's not our fault. <laughs> Following God's lead, God said he'll take care of us. So when you grumble, you're grumbling against God. He hasn't done anything for you recently, has he? That is not a good practice to maintain. God will once again magnify himself by supplying their daily necessity of food so that they can recognize daily that he is able and willing and does meet their every need. Verse 9, so Moses says to Aaron, All right, say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, because he hears your murmurings, he hears your complainings. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Well, who have they been murmuring about and against? And here comes God showing up. That the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses and said, Oh, I've heard the complaining. I've heard the murmuring of the children of Israel. I want you to speak unto them, and here's what you I want you to tell them. At twilight, you're going to eat flesh, and in the morning you're going to be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about, you know, the host of the camp. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there's a small, round, flaky thing, as thin as the horror frost on the ground. It kind of looked like frozen dew, which I'm sure you guys in the south have seen a lot. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna. It is man the word for manna, basically what they said was, what is it? What is the word manna means, what is it? What is this? I don't know what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. A full month had gone by before they complained of lack of food. So they brought food with them. They, they brought about a month's supply. Now they're out of food. All right, verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer 
for every man, according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered, some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. No one lack. All got filled to their chosen limit. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet featuring angel food. Psalm 78, 23. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn, the bread, cereal, grains of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat, food, or nourishment to the full. And in Exodus 16, 19, we continue on our journey with the manna. And Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning. And it bred worms or maggots and stank. And Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Sabbath means sacred rest or solemn rest or complete rest. The concept of having a day of rest started with God in Genesis. Genesis 2, 2, and 3. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. The Sabbath was to become a sign between God and the children of Israel. Exodus 31, 16, and 17. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations. <laughs> For a perpetual covenant, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The Israelites were not acquainted with the Sabbath. They didn't get a day off in Egypt. God has Moses teach them the purpose of the Sabbath. All right, 16, we jump down to the second half of verse 23. Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will, bake it today, and see there boil that which you will see, and that which remains over, lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Now, this isn't how it's preserved. Some people think that, well, yeah, by boiling and baking it, you can get your second day. So you had to prepare it for the next day, for two days worth, okay? And you had to really seal it in this airtight container so it would still be good. They had already tried all that, and it didn't work, okay? And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses laid, and it didn't stink. It was not melodious. Neither was there any maggots in it. And Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day, on the seventh day and they went out to get and looked around. And went, There's nothing here. And the Lord said to Moses, in verse 20, it was Moses who got wroth with the people. Here, though, when it came to the Sabbath, which belongs to the Lord, it was the Lord who gets unhappy with the people. Verse 28. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye, every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The giving of bread daily was to be a reminder of the children of Israel the blessings of the Lord. They were to realize daily that God would meet their need. The attitude was to be that God would bless them so much that they would want to keep his commandments. Verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed white and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey i went to lunch at richard bruno 
and the place we normally go was closed. So he called. So he said, "Where do you want to go?" I said, "Any place you pick." So he called me back in a couple of minutes. He said, "Let's go to Mana Cafe," and I was right in the middle of proofing all of this. And you know what street Mana Cafe is on? Coriander Street, <laughs> cool. up there in Castle Rock. Anyway. Coriander seed is gray, yellow in color, an aromatic herb with strong smelling seed like fruit that is used as a flavoring for culinary and medical purposes. So, coriander seed is something they were familiar with. Verse 32. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord, to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. It would later be placed in front of the Ark of the Covenant once the tabernacle is built. Verse 35, And the children of Israel did eat manna for 40 years, until they came into the land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came under the borders of the land of Canaan. And you know, you read that in Joshua. As soon as they come come there and cross the river, the you know, Jordan River, it stops. In case you're wondering, and Omer is a tenth part of an ephod, though. Now, earlier in Exodus 16, 13, God mentions that he would supply meat too in the form of quails. So let's go to Numbers 11, verse 4, and we'll look at that record. And the mixed multitude, I, I read a bunch of different translations, and they're, they're, you know, and the rabble or the gathered riffraff. That's what they translated this mixed multitude. That's just a bunch of rabble, a bunch of riffraff. You know, that was among them, fell a lusting. So the children of Israel also wept against who's gonna give us lunch to eat? We remember the fish where we did eat in Egypt freely. Freely? Oh, you were a slave. That's you weren't eating freely. You were a slave. And I remember the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Some of the mixed multitude were people from other Semitic tribes who had migrated to Egypt to work on some of the building projects. Because of the hard labor, many of these people had sided with the Israelites. Some were born of mixed marriages. These were the first people to complain. They were not accustomed to desert life. They thought their departure with the Israelites would bring them not only freedom from hard labor, but also happiness and prosperity. Unfortunately for them, they found the desert life was harder than labor in Egypt. Both the mixed people and the Israelites were accustomed to eating vegetables in large variety. There was also plenty of meat, fish, chicken, geese, fruit. The Egyptians are noted for their lavish tables. In the land of the Nile, plenty. As one crop is gathered, another one is ripening, and a new one is planted. So you got one crop you're gathering, another one is ripening, and the next one you plant. So it just keeps rotating. Fruit and vegetables are scarce, though, in the desert. The generations of the Israelites who were born in Egypt had never experienced desert difficulties. Numbers 11, verse 6. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. All we get for food is this free, nourishing, appetizing, filling, able to be served in a variety of ways. All you can <laughs> eat food, tasty food stuff. Oh, it just reminds us of God's goodness every day. Boo hoo hoo, wah wah wah. Verse 7. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color, the appearance aspect thereof, as the color of bdellium, a certain semi-clear resin or sap. And the people went about and gathered it, and ground it in mills, or beat it in mortar, and baked it in pans, and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil, cakes baked with oil, something rich made with oil. When the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Oh, I mean, they, they probably had manna cookbooks, they traded recipes. <laughs> They went online to the Mana Channel. You know, it was very versatile, this product. But the people felt they weren't being treated right. Verse 10, and Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. 
or it flared up exceedingly. It blazed hotly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted, or why have you dealt ill with me, your servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in your sight that you laid the burden of all these people upon me? You know, it's my fault. It's not my fault of these two and a half million people. You know, come on, God. Have I conceived all these people? Have I begotten them that they should say unto me, carry them in thy bosom? As a nursing father bears a sucking child into the land, which thou swears unto the fathers, what am I going to give them meat or flesh to give all the people? They weep unto me, saying, give us flesh that we may eat. I'm not able to bear to carry all these people alone. This burden is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, why don't you just kill me? Put me out of my misery, God. You know, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my own wretchedness, my own ill fortune. You know, Moses is ready to give up, and they're only been, you know, out there for a little while. God was also going to get Moses some help in dealing with the burden of the people by putting his spirit upon 70 of the elders. And it's really, it's real interesting that this is right in the middle of them of him God meeting the needs with meat for all the people, but he also first meets the need of Moses who needs help. Verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the children of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them into the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, but thou bear it not thyself alone. God addresses his representative Moses' need first before solving the grumblings of the people. Verse 18 says, and then say to the people, Sanctify yourself against tomorrow. You're going to eat flesh. For we have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who will give us flesh or meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt when you were slaves. Therefore, the Lord's going to give you flesh, and you're going to eat. You're not going to eat just one day. He's not going to supply just one day. He's not going to supply two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days. He'll give you enough for a whole month until it comes out your nostrils. And it'd be loathsome unto you, because that you have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him saying, why can't we forth out of Egypt? All you got to do is ask politely. All right? Don't, you know, no accusations, no crumble. Just Moses, it'd be nice if we had, you know, we had some meat. Abraham had some interesting discourses with God. Moses does likewise. He's trying to figure out now how God is going to be able to pull this off. He's using his own limited foresight, trying to figure out how God is going to feed these people for a whole month. Look, he's trying to do God's job. Verse 21. And Moses said, people among who I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? The Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my words shall come to pass unto thee or not. God has it all figured out, as he always does. Moses, you will see. Be patient. Help is on the way. Verse 24, Moses went out and told the people the word of the Lord. And then he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people, set them round about the tabernacle, and the Lord came down into a cloud and spake unto him, took of the spirit that was upon him, gave it unto the 70 elders, and it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and they did not cease. I've always had a problem, but they did not cease. But looking at the Hebrew and all the translations, they, did, they, they prophesied, but they did not continue to prophesy. They didn't do it again. It just was a show to them that they had received the spirit. Same thing happened with Saul when he was made king. He met up with the company of the prophets. The Spirit came upon him. He prophesied, but never did it again. So uh, I guess God has a reason to prove that he, these guys have the Spirit, but it wasn't something, it wasn't a manifestation like it is today. It was a ministry. And so these people proved that they had the Spirit. God could talk to them, but they never prophesied again on his behalf. 
All right, Bob, continue. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his youngest men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Because two stayed in the camp? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. This is incredibly insightful into the heart of God. His real desire was that all his people were prophets who could speak on his behalf, that every one of them had his spirit upon them so he could communicate directly to them without having to go through a priest or mediator. That's what God always wanted. Fortunately, he's only had to sell for 70. That's all he can get. That's all he's got right there. But today, every one of his child has the spirit. It's a fulfillment of what God wanted as brought out here in Numbers. Verse 30. Moses got him into the camp, and he said, and he and the elders of Israel, and there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, as it were two cubits high upon three the face of the earth, three feet above the face of the earth. Right. So two cubits is about three feet. The quail is a small bird of the grouse family, about seven inches long, and are partly dependent on wind for their migration journeys. They are abundant in all temperate regions of Europe and Western Asia. They migrate to and from Africa. Thousands of flocks of quail winter in the warm Arabian desert and Africa. And these quail just happen by during their migration season. At times, they're caught by strong winds and fall exhausted on the ground, especially when flying nonstop during the 200-mile journey over the Mediterranean Sea. In the spring, there are hundreds of thousands of them in the Syrian deserts and Arabia flying to the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. The two cubics high, totally around the camp, maybe a figure illustrating that there were more than plenty available and accessible to all areas of the camp. If a day's journey around the camp was taken literally, it would have been impossible for the flocks and the herds to graze and the people to walk. The flocks and herds generally grazed a few miles from the camp. So, you know, I always looked at it and pictured that all around the camp, there it was. But basically, when you, when you went out from the camp, didn't matter if you were in the north part of the camp, south part, east or west, there was plenty available from wherever you were. But you had to have a pathway to be able to get to your animals that were out there. Verse 32, you know, because your animals wouldn't stay in camp. They'd be outside the camp. So you had to get to them. The two and the people, verse 32, stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day. And they gathered their quails. And I know they utilized baseball bats because he gathered at the least gathered at least 10 homers worth. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And in case you were wondering, a homer was originally an ass load or a heap. And so we've got food every day. We got quail. We got meat. And we're going to stop complaining. 